welcome to the Objective Secure Podcast. My name's Mike. Hi, I'm Emma. And this is episode 31, Uptown Funk. We're going to be um, talking how to get yourself out of a rut, how to get yourself a bit of a hobby funk and you need to break that routine. Mm -hmm. So we're going to start chatting about some of the things you might be able to do to help break that. And we're just in time for Christmas Mm. here in 2018. So maybe it's a good time to start looking at some of this stuff so that when your new projects start rolling in for your Christmas from all your family and friends, it's a great opportunity to implement some of these. Yeah, so what I was thinking, so this uh, topic actually came in from um, someone on the Ask Us Anything that we did last Wednesday night. Shout out to Timo for and, the question. And um, yeah, sometimes, well, we do try and answer as many of those questions as possible, but sometimes when they come in, they need a little bit more thought and a little bit more uh, discussion than we can generally do on those um, light-hearted kind of um, general overview type discussions and so we thought we'd give it a little bit more focus and that's why we're doing this today but it also works really well because in a fortnight we can do something on goal setting for 2019 uh, which are some of my favorite topics oh yay i know you're really good at goal setting um <laughs> so yeah that's so i thought we could look at how we can get out of a rut and find some motivation and then for the next episode we can maybe look at setting some goals for 2019 how we can achieve them yeah um we've if you've been watching the live stuff or any of the um the stuff that's come out from our end of the world in uh, late november and early december you'll know that we've just come back from the uk Mm -hmm. and um we are dreadfully jet lagged still yeah we're, we're still um still readjusting to the timing and the temperature and all the rest of it um but uh, my own little personal hobby funk breaker is currently sat just behind emma and off to behind me it's actually scattered all around this room at the mm. moment how unusual <laughs> it's a big kit mm. so my it's wa- a big room <laughs> that is true but it was i was set up for filming some of the assembly of this kit because i haven't actually seen any really detailed builds of this particular kit so i've got a warlord forge world patent titan um, and I'm currently filming and building the head at the moment, and um, I am procrastinating, I know that. I'm trying to avoid doing the legs because they terrify me. Um, but a friend of ours, uh, Connor, has just sent me photos. He's in the same situation as me, building a, a warlord, and uh, he's just sent me photos showing that he's finished building all the legs and the assembly to the waist, so now I actually have to pull my finger out and try and bite the bullet and just do it, mm-hmm. which is slightly terrifying. But... Um, I am actually enjoying, it's the first time I've actually really, really wanted to do hobby in quite some time, actually. Mm. Like, I've forced myself to do bits and pieces of it um, in the lead up to us going away in the hopes of trying to get an army ready. As it turns out, it wasn't really necessary because I didn't get a chance to play games, even if I had brought an army with me. But um, that was still a chore, whereas I'm actually relishing this kit at the moment. So, trying to seize on that and actually get the damn thing built and... um, move into 2019 with a warlord in in the process if not at least on the table and i don't think you're gonna have that warlord built by the first of january i beg to differ okay i'm go for it i'm very hopeful that um our annual apocalypse game and i don't know whether he listens to these podcasts but uh, if dizzy does he should get a very rude shock because um this kit i'm aiming to have on the table sometime in the first week in january with base colors on it Mm. Yeah. Look, uh, spray cans will go a long way to getting the base colours down. Mm-hmm. But um, I don't see... Like, having gone through the instructions and all the rest of it, I don't see why it can't be achieved. I do. <laughs> I'm married to him for 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> Look, And if ever you needed motivation, there you go. That's yeah. It. Hey, can I have another one if I do get it done? No. Oh, I was hoping she'd slip up then. No. Look, to be fair, I do have two other Titans that can go straight after this one, back to back. And mm. um, and how long have you had those? No comment. No, no, how long have you no, had no those? No, no comment. We're not talking about that. No, no, I think we are. No, we're not. I feel like we are. We're going to move on. Right. <laughs> so, uh, I'm going to do uh, the Legio Ataris, which if you jump on Google, it comes up pretty easily. They're the Firebrands. They've got a big burning sword as their logo. Red, black and white. At some point in time in the past... Uh, past Mike was very forward thinking and bought a, a set of the transfer sheets for Legio Ataris, which are yeah, now dis- forward thinking. Let's go with that, not w- hoarder. Which are now discontinued, so you can't buy them anymore. But they came with the warlord size transfers on them as well, so that's very fortunate for me to have that. 
And I've just got to make sure I don't use Hold two. on a minute. I'll try and contain my excitement <laughs> over that. Well, okay, it, I think I've got it under control. I think I've got enough transfers on that sheet to do the Warhound to match it as well. So that's good. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> my Christmas is made. <laughs> it makes it easy to buy your present that way. You just take photos of the stuff and show you the money we're saving. Oh, yeah. Let's go with that. <laughs> um, what else has happened? We um, caught up, well, I caught up with Lawrence from Tabletop Tactics mm-hmm. and um, had a, a night out drinking and chatting and talking hobby. Um, I got to meet Duncan and Guy Haley mm-hmm. while we are in Warhammer World. Mm-hmm. Uh, and a good friend of ours, Jordan Gray, joined me for the expedition through the exhibits at Warhammer World, which was mm-hmm. really cool. Didn't find the assassin, which was hiding in the um, the big Space Marine, Chaos Space Marine combat, which was just mammoth in terms of scale. And I'm beginning to think maybe they hadn't reset him in time because we spent a good yeah, hour yeah, between the two of us. That. <laughs> definitely is that. Mm, definitely. Um, so we had a really good time at Warhammer World. Um, I know you were less enthused about that. Yeah, look, it's it's tricky. I think that trying to be there with three kids, one of them's yeah. quite small, um, is it has its challenges. So. Yeah, I mean, um, you guys came for the morning, had a drink in Bugman's Bar, mm-hmm. and then um, took the kids off to go and do tourist things, which is a whole other story, which didn't quite work out the way we'd planned. Didn't work out the way we'd planned, no. Um, While well, I hung around at Warhammer World for the day with Jordan, and then we met back up in the afternoon and uh, went out for dinner. Mm-hmm. So, and then I had to go back, sadly. Yeah. <laughs> Had to go back and had to accidentally buy a few more things. It was one thing. I bought the the soundtrack CD, which I'd never heard of before, and I thought that's a cool thing because I couldn't get this other stuff that I wanted. It was all out of production or out of print or out of stock. So it was very frustrating. So I came away with one souvenir. Actually, that's not true. I came away with three souvenirs because I found these today while I was going through things. There's two souvenir coins here. Are you actually showing that? No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm going I'm to read what's <laughs> on them and then I'm going to take a photo and put it in the show notes. <laughs> it looked like you were trying to show that to no, the no, camera. No. I'm like, no, this is a voice recording only. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> no, I can see that. I'm not that stupid. Yeah, uh, no. one, one says one imperial credit and it's got the Aquila on one side and then on the other side it's got the, um, the Primaris Mark IV style. It's actually the Mark X armor, but it's the Mark IV style helmet. Honor thy emperor, honor thy chapter. And then the other one I've got is... Let the Galaxy Burn with a Chaos Space Marine helmet and then a whole bunch of Chaos Runes and an eight-pointed star on the other side. They're really kind of cool. So I'm going to get some photos of those and put them in the show notes because they're really the only souvenir things that um, I got. And they were in the foyer. Mm. They were just um, like a pound each or whatever they were. So um, Yeah, I'm annoyed because I tried to get a uh, Warhammer World Christmas bauble and they didn't have any and now they do. Oh, do they really? Yeah. Oh, that's annoying. It is annoying. But anyway. Anyone over there at the moment won't feel like posting no. one? <laughs> doesn't count if we don't buy it ourselves. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> I'm trying to think where I can apply that to, but doesn't nothing springs to mind at the moment. No. Anyway, so um, yeah, we've enjoyed our little jaunt on holidays and we're currently planning for... 2019's events and I'm just waiting to hear back from some of the venues and Mm. we'll set some dates and announce those shortly but um, rather than chatting any more in this introduction why don't we take a quick break and we'll get straight into the topic for tonight So, hobby funks, hobby ruts, whatever you want to call it. Mm. Um, it's something I think that every hobbyist hits at some point in time or another. Um, maybe the crazy ones don't. And if you're listening to this and you think, oh, that's never happened to me, take that as a compliment rather than an insult because um, I know over the 30-odd years I've been doing this hobby, I've always had ups and downs where I've spent more time on it or less time on it as real life dictated and my own interest waxed and waned. Mm. Um, and I know there's... Um, several local hobbyists who have been really hardcore into it over the last couple of years and are now kind of, not disenfranchised, but um, 
yeah, stuck in a rut and don't really have an enthusiasm to go on and do other things. So we're going to talk about some of the techniques and things you can do to try and break some of that um, funk and get back stuck into stuff that you enjoy. Yeah, so um, the first kind of point that I wanted to make is that really what we're talking about is motivation. So motivation is a fire that has to come from within. And the thing is that no one else can light it for you. If you know if somebody else does, then it might burn for a little while, but it's going to burn briefly. So this has to come from you. That's a very um, poetic way of putting it. Which is not bad, given the time. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, I do honestly believe that nobody else can motivate you. You are the only person who yeah, right. is in control of it. So um, it has to be about making some changes so that you're feeling it, not just based on what some other people are doing or saying. Um, having said that, I think that in the intro, without, no doubt, without realising, you've probably covered some of the points that I wanted to talk about tonight, but I will get to those One of the advantages of not reading your notes. Yes. <laughs> Given that I want to still be talking to you by the end of it, I'm going to keep moving on. Fair enough. So I think the first part, the first point is probably to actually take a step back and work out what's happening that's actually causing you to be in that rut. So what is it that's actually, um, where have you lost that passion? So have you got any examples around what that might be? Um, I'd put it down to, um, I put hobby burnout down to a lot of things actually. When you, you sort of, um, when it does start becoming a chore, a lot of the time for tournament players, that's building armies and painting and prepping for an event. Mm. And you're no longer, um, you're no longer, playing the game for fun you're no longer building the model because it's cool or building them necessarily the models you want to build um so you you it becomes a chore it, you literally put it into a position where it's no longer fun and you're doing it because you have to do it not because you want to do it so i don't know i think um it's easy to have that happen if you're not paying attention to how much if you i suppose if you focus on too much of the one thing hmm. um it's all well and good doing a passion project like my my warlord is a great example. I want to do that at the moment. I'm mad keen to do it. The idea of going and doing one, doing a second Titan, which I have immediately after it, doesn't fill me with a great deal of enthusiasm because no. I know I'm going to want to go and do something else. Mm. So that's fine, and I I can already see that on the horizon. Oh, knowing so can I. Yeah, I, I know I'm a magpie in that regard, mm. but. If you if you do sort of go okay, I'm going to paint three titans in a row to to get this done because I've got them and I want them done. By the time you get to the third one, it's either going to be crap or you're not going to finish it. Hmm. So, I, I think too much of one type of hobby, I suppose, is the way I'd answer your question. I think there's um, I think there's a few different reasons, a few different things for different people that can lead to that kind of burnout or stagnation as well. And one of the things that often isn't talked about. Um, can be decision fatigue as well. And I've seen this happen with you quite a few times uh, where you've been, um, you know, for example, with the Harlequins, you, there were just so many decisions and trying to make a decision around what paint scheme you were going to use with decision upon decision upon decision upon decision upon decision, that one decision was too much and so they just didn't get done. Mm, that's true. And, you know, when you think about hobby... There are so many decisions to be made that actually, I think a lot of people d don't give decision fatigue the attention that it could possibly need. So that's one yeah. one area where I think that um, that can come into it. That could even just be as simple as picking a new army. It's all of it. You think you've got to pick a new army, what, what units are going into the army, how many units, what weapons are they going to have, how are you going to build them, are you going to convert them, are you going to scratch build, are you going, you know, then you look at what kind of um, paint scheme you're going to have, what vehicles, are you, you know, all of those things, that comes into it all the time and that's before you actually put a model down on the table. Yeah, okay, that, that actually makes a great deal of sense and, and you know, at a macro level... Um, yeah, you're picking one of, I mean, for Warhammer 40,000, you're picking one of, I think it's nearly 30 factions. Maybe it's maybe it's in the 20s. Um, it's not even but, one of 30 anymore, is well, it? Well, I was about to say, and then within each of those, there tends to be five or six sub-factions, yeah. and that's 
partly to do with color scheme and partly to do with rules. And then you have to then go, am I building this because I like the models? Am I building this for a tournament? And that'll change more of the decisions. And often players like to have both in that environment, which means that it's easy to then get fatigued halfway through the project because you're now painting stuff that you don't necessarily want to paint. Yeah, there's a, a lot of stuff in that whole process that can go wrong. Mm. And I, I think that it's something like people, you you obviously get that when you've got, um, you know, if you're playing with an army that is perhaps from an older edition and it's, or, you know, the codex has been updated or the um, chapter approved has come out and there's been changes made and so it has negatively impacted your army, you're losing games, your army doesn't work the way that you intended it anymore. You can see how that can lead to this kind of hobby slump yeah because that seems obvious but things like the decision fatigue it's it's not necessarily obvious yeah um, i wouldn't have even considered it no there you go <laughs> so other things obviously is like the, um, what i just stated uh, about the you know the changes that are outside of your control um also you know, I've got bad games written down as well. And there's a few different ways that I think that you can have bad games. And part of that could be the group that you're playing with. You may not be in a positive gaming environment and having fun games. Yeah. You might be used to playing, you know, you're playing the same guys or girls over and over and over every week and you're just over it. Yeah, I mean, I was very fortunate while um, a very good friend of mine lived nearby he and I gamed every week almost, mm. barring children's births, anniversaries. Well, there were a lot of those, though. You know, in no, all I mean, fairness. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know, apart from key like yeah. mo- like life points moments. in life, yeah. we gamed pretty much every Tuesday for the better yeah. part of ten years. Yeah, and I think the few times we actually had ruts, either he or he did or I did were overcome by just changing up what we were doing. That's exactly it. So you played with um, the same guy for, like you say, about 10 years. But you both have how many different armies? Yeah. You know, and other guys cycled in and out of that as well. So you didn't, you weren't necessarily, you know, I can think that perhaps for some newer gamers, if they only have one army and their two friends that play only have one army and you're playing the same game yeah. every week, week in, week out, you're going to hit some kind of wall and kind of going, you know what, we've kind of done this already. Yeah, and I, I suppose you're right that, that Brett and I never really had that take place because between the two of us, we basically owned every army mm. and we could chop and change sharing armies between us because we had a little bit of crossover as well. Yeah, you're also happy to think outside the box and um, I was going to say do stupid things. I don't mean do stupid things, but I mean not necessarily... Oh, I know you hate this, but not necessarily game to the meta, but, you know, change things up a bit. Yeah. Because you knew each other well enough that it was okay f- for things to be fun and not necessarily about who was winning. Yeah, oh, absolutely. I mean, we um, we played a lot all through what must have been most of the noughties, sort of 2004? Yep. 2005, somewhere in there, all the way through to 2012 yep. when they moved. Yep. And, um, yeah, we played well, every format we could come up with, every game we could come up with, every combination of units we could come up with. Um, he scratch-built uh, a Warlord Titan, yeah. Big Red. Um, I wonder if he's still got that. If he does, I'll have to get a photo. Um, you know, we, we played a lot, hmm. but even the, the weeks when we weren't necessarily feeling it, it was still... We still had a social engagement there, which I think was also a big driving factor in us not getting stagnated in the that process. Yeah. And when one of us did have a break, it was usually both of us at the same time. And those games following those were just the weird ones where I remember a night um, we hadn't moved to the house we live in at the moment, actually, because I remember we were down at, um, at our last house and we were playing in the, the carpool, not the carpool, in the patio area. And it was just after I finished painting the Revenant. So this is probably somewhere in 05, 06. Yeah. And um, we played about three games in a row with him just trying to kill it. Yeah. And we'd play, I mean, at the time we were playing every tournament we possibly could. And those were just silly games and, you know, 
they were good fun. Mm. And that's um, kind of what we're trying to rekindle and have done for the last few years with a couple of other friends, with Dizzy and our annual Apocalypse Games. Mm. It's about bringing out all the toys and catching up over the day for, you know, drinks and fun and breaking up that cycle of matched play gaming. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, the last one, well, there's lo- obviously lots of reasons that people can find themselves in a hobby slump. Um, but one of the other ones that I've got down is the um, changes to the systems. So, for example, with 30K, that obviously stayed in 7th edition. And a lot of people who played both 30K and 40K, the 40K players moved to 8th edition, which meant they weren't necessarily playing 30K anymore. And I think that that can affect uh, the... You know, basically that can affect people's motivation as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think any of the addition changes for any game sees players' motivation levels change. Um, to, I mean, we're looking at the end of Malifaux second edition at the moment with third edition due for release at some point between now and I think March of 2019. Mm-hmm. And I know a lot of players have kind of slowed down and um, sort of holding their breath, waiting for that release. Yeah. We saw the same thing with um, every cycle that Games Workshop produces. There's always a sort of a lull mm. before the, the release. And then inevitably there's attrition within the community they don't like as, the people, as people don't or... like the changes or they, yeah. they use it as an opportunity to take a break or... Um, they don't have the funds to change over. Yep. Um, there's a whole raft of reasons why people don't move immediately to the new system. But those um, those also can create situations where you just don't feel like doing hobby. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, But I think that the reason that I'm bringing up all these reasons that people can end up in this kind of slump is that without knowing what's causing that without knowing what's causing it, it's very difficult to actually address it. Yeah. So I think it's really important. It sounds counterintuitive that when you're in a slump to take a step backwards, but I think that's probably the most important thing to actually take that step back and look at the bigger picture and find out what exactly is it that's happening for me that's causing me to kind of go, nah, this hobby that I've loved for 20 years, 30 years, six or months, year, eight yeah. months, you know, I'm now, I've invested all this money in it, all my time, all my energy, I loved it, and now I'm going, nah, I'm just going to shove it in a shoebox in the back of the cupboard. <laughs> if you've only got a shoebox shoe box worth of stuff, I don't think you love it that much. <laughs> you know what I mean. I know. Um, so I couldn't think of a box big enough. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm going to have it, I'm going to pack the cupboard with it and then, yeah. No, I get what you mean. I, I think... F- Using myself, the last nine months, I haven't really done any personal hobby over that time. I've done a model here and there, but yeah. um, we got back from our trip to the America last year. I did one model then, two models then, and I've done yeah the odd odd bit here and there of building. And uh, I built the um, the witch cult um, most recently, but like I say, there was there was a spark of inspiration, but not enough to drive me to actually put paint to model it's all assembled and it's ready for paint but um part of that was i didn't feel like i was getting enough game time because i haven't really played a lot in the last six months Mm -hmm. um whereas i think apart from the fact that it's my 40th birthday present and it's a cool big model the warlord also and I will kill you if that sits in a box in the dungeon for the next however long. Look, I... It's a really strong motivating <laughs> factor, I think. So we're going to put that on our list of motivators. If you can get your wife to threaten bodily injury... <laughs> yeah, that's true. I am joking. I don't actually um, think family and domestic violence is a joking issue. Well, in any case, the big thing for me at the moment is um, I'm excited to build it and paint it because I want to show it off and I want to have... Um, have it on the table and I've got a game that I know is going to happen sometime yeah. in the first week of January and I've already got plans for other games with it for the rest of the year. I've got friends who I suggested this game to and he's sending me army lists of stuff to play against it. The model's still in a million pieces mm-hmm. and he's already writing army lists to try and kill it. That alone makes me want to finish building it because I want to play that game out because yeah. we can theory it all we like we want to put it on the table and see what actually happens, which is the whole point of the, the idea game. I proposed to him and the whole point of playing is to get have these cool moments. So um, I'm sure that the next time I get a an opportunity to build and paint this witch cult, I will. 
But um, at the moment, I'm all about trying to build and paint this thing and it's mm. presenting its own challenges at the moment with um, my own insecurities and whatnot, but <laughs> we'll, we'll try and move past that. The legs. Um, <laughs> yeah, the legs are scary. So I think once you know where your, I guess, where your stopping point is or pain point, it then becomes a little bit easier to try and work out what you can do. But really going back to basics, it's about reminding yourself what's your why. You know, so what is it about this game that you love? Why did you start? Why, you know, why did you play for the last X amount of years? Why have you invested so much of your time, so much of your life into this? Why do you love it? I don't know that's an easy question for many gamers to answer because... Really? <laughs> there's a, questions like that. Awesome. There's a so whole bunch easy of, to answer. There's a whole bunch of intangibles for me. Like I like the social aspects that come alongside it. Mm -hmm. I enjoy the creative component of it, mm -hmm. um, the skill component of it in mm -hmm. terms of building and painting it. Mm -hmm. But it's hard to articulate. You've just articulated. No, it. no, no. There's it's way more complex than I've just made it in my head. But does it need to be? Haven't you just got to turn to the crux of it? You get to hang out with friends. You get to use your creativity. You get to use artistic skills. You get to actually put strategy in place, plus rules, plus there's the law that goes with it. You got all of that all goes together to create an enjoyable experience that you want to have fun playing these games. When you put it like that, it doesn't seem very difficult <laughs> at all. I know, but that that's my my situation. I know plenty of people who only paint and you know the they would quite happily play with bare plastic models because they're but that's their why. Yeah. They they love playing the game or they love painting the models or they love hanging out with mates. Mm. So what is it about this game that you love? And if you find that the thing that you love most about this game is playing in garages with friends, why are you pushing yourself to go and play in tournaments? You know, like... Yeah. If it's about going, let's strip away all the stuff on the outside of it and let's go... What do I, what am I actually getting from this? What do I want from this? And what am I getting from this? And how do I get what I want? Yeah, that's true. I know um, uh, the person in question who posed this original question, um, he's done a huge amount of amazing hobby, particularly over the last 12 months, 18 months. And he took a breather from one game system and kind of did some work in another one. Mm -hmm. And... He was. He's then posed this question, and I haven't seen him do a lot of work lately, um, online anywhere. And part of me wondered whether or not the change in game system was trying to scratch the same itch, but not finding the same connection that he had with his primary game. Mm. And I wonder: is that connection with the people, or is it the connection with the system? Yeah. And that's not necessarily wondering it for that particular person, but as. Speaking, yeah, I guess generally. No, it's a good point. I mean, if your social group has changed so that you can't play as often with them and you're there now playing something else or um, the club that you would normally go to for whatever reason means that you can't go those nights and your personal circumstances changed, so now you have to go to a different store or a different club, then that can change your motivations as well, particularly if you're not enjoying yourself. So, other suggestions that I have... If you were, not necessarily you, but anybody who's listening. <laughs> colloquially you. Um, co yeah, the colloquial you. If you were to think about either three people, um, so three, either people or podcasts or blogs, that when you talk to them or you listen to them or you read whatever they've written, when you're, when you're engaged with that person, podcast or blog, that you feel like you come alive or you feel inspired, then what is it? that you last heard from them or read from them that made you feel inspired? What can you take from that and how can you use that to motivate yourself now? Okay. That's an interesting one. I'm going to use a local hobbyist as my example for this. Um, if you've seen his uh, Tau Armies at our recent events, his name's Anthony. Mm -hmm. Very, very talented hobbyist. Um, I'm currently leeching ideas out of his brain on how to paint the Warlord. 
because in my head I know how I want it to look Mm -hmm. and I have a level of skill that will get me, let's be optimistic and say 80% of the way there. Mm, Yeah. And I know that he can help me fill in the gaps in my hobby knowledge and I'm fortunate that he's um, a supporter of ours and uh, he's already offered some time for me to go down with the kit in pieces and sort of show me some of the techniques and um, really help me develop some of my hobby skills. So the what I'm getting from him is the ability to push myself out of my comfort zone and, and create new skills for my own hobby, which yeah. going forward will allow me to apply those in other projects. Mm. Admittedly, doing it to this particular project seems like a bit of a risk, but we're just going to ignore oh, well, that and keep going. Yeah, definitely. Push through. Um, But so one of the things that I like about um, Anthony's models that I find exciting to look at is the the way that he paints the ends of the guns. Oh, like the lighting style effects and... No, um, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be very descriptive here. So basically he paints the guns so that they are heat damaged. Yeah, yeah. Um, So the the multi-barrel guns that um, heat warp essentially, they go through blues and purples and... Yeah, I've done a little bit of that over the years. Um, so we were talking about that at the last event that we ran. Heat stressed metal. Okay, yep, that. Great. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so he was saying that he was showing one of the other hobbyists in the room how to do that. And so this other hobbyist would contact him and said, hey, look, I love the way that you do that. And so he'd offered to meet with him and teach him how to do it. And the other hobbyist was like, well you know, are you happy to share that secret with me? And he's going, well, of course I'm happy to share it with you because it's about how we can all work together and, you know, share share the love kind of thing. And he learned it from somewhere and so why wouldn't he pass that on? And I think that's awesome. Um, and there's a saying that you're the sum total of the five people who you spend most time, most of your time with. So when it comes to getting out of that kind of slump, it's about choosing the people who are going to be positive and uplifting and who are going to motivate you and share that kind of excitement and be happy to share skills in the area that you're most passionate about rather than the people who are also in a slump and who don't want to share it because they're protective of something that they've learned and they don't want to they want to be better than anybody else and you know so it's around looking at who you're actually spending your time with as well yeah Absolutely. I think um, I, I think finding someone, particularly a local, hmm. um, who you can either challenge yourself with or, um, you know, sh- you obviously have to be kind of like-minded in that regard. If you're going to spend any real time around someone else, you have to kind of get on is what I mean. Hmm. Um, but um, I definitely think um, looking at your own skills and and trying to expand on those whether that's hobby skills or on the table or um i've done a couple of those over the years where people have come around looking for games just to try and make things work or get ideas and advice yeah um and they're always really cool because you can you you know you're imparting something on someone else and that was what i was going to say as well i think it's really important to try and um create a mentor mentee relationship Mm. But I think that it's really important to be both a mentor and a mentee as well. So that you find someone who... um, You don't want to spend your time with people whose skill levels are lower than you all the time. Purely to make yourself feel better. Yeah. Well, I'm better than all the people I play with. So I'm obviously the best player in our group. And that's awesome because I'm fantastic. You're not going to get better if you're not challenging yourself. And part of that rut can be that you're not actually growing. And so by by being a mentee and trying to find a mentor, and it does, obviously I'm not suggesting creating a formal mentor-mentee relationship, but this can be inf- as informal as you want. But it can be as simple as going down to a GW store and finding someone there who's happy to help you out with how you can improve you know, some of your painting skills or your modelling skills or your actual tabletop skills. But then also finding someone who you can share those extra skills that you've got with i think a lot of the time so um in the in the example of anthony giving me these painting ideas mm-hmm. and like i want to learn how to paint marble mm-hmm. and i want to do it with white so the titan shoulder pads will be these big white gray marble panels 
in my head, I know how I want them to look. Mm-hmm. That's a very vast difference to actually making that happen. Yeah. Um, and I've got a few ideas and I've done some Google research, but there's nothing quite like doing it yeah, with doing someone it. Yeah. there to give you advice who has already successfully achieved what you want. By uh, He and I aren't generally in the same gaming circle, though. We know each other through events and we chat online, but that's kind of the extent of it. Because the two of us have got a good relationship, it means that if I then put photos of this on the OBSEC page when it's all done, there's an opportunity there to give him credit from where I learned it from, but also share that with our readers and our listeners about how it got there so that someone else potentially picks it up. Mm. So um, there's a good sort of symbiotic relationship there by passing that on through different people because like you said he learns that stuff from somewhere else Mm -hmm. and his focus is very squarely on the hobby side of it less about the gaming Um, not that he doesn't do well at that but that's certainly his area of where he gets his most joy from the the hobby um so really the mentor mentee thing was not part of my list that just popped into my head (laughs) Uh, but it is about finding those people who are going to motivate and inspire you and have a conversation with them. Mm. You know, so if you find that you're feeling flat, find someone who you know that when you talk to them, lights that spark and talk to them. Yeah. And And then act on it. Well, like you said, though, you've got to make sure that that person isn't in a similar situation to you where you, you know, you're going and going, oh, you know, man, like, I'm really, really trying to come up with a new project here. What do you think? Oh, you know don't really care at the moment. I'm a bit a bit off it at the moment. That's not going to do you any favours at all. No, that's exactly it. And that's one of the points that I've got. It really is about surrounding yourself with passionate people. Mm. And ultimately, any any sort of luxury hobby has to be a passion. Whether it's tabletop gaming or anything else, um, any sort of luxury pastime is always going to be a passion for someone. Mm. Um, it's not a necessity is what I'm trying to get at. No. And... You know, as much as I complain about the whole social media and the fact that no one's actually social anymore, it does mean that we have access to people all over the world. Yeah. You know, so there's nothing to stop you reaching out to people literally anywhere in the world. There's Skype and Zoom and FaceTime and all of these things as well, as well as just, you know, typing messages through Messenger. But, um, you know, you can actually meet with people Virtually. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that having people around you that are going to excite you and, you know, get all the juices flowing is fantastic. I think a lot of the um, the hobby groups that you find on, whether it's Facebook or Instagram or any of those social media outlets, alongside the adjoining blogs that are inevitably attached to those or websites or podcasts or YouTube channels or any of the other... Um, any of those other things, you can you can kind of create your own little micro community. Um, like I really enjoy watching the Tabletop Tactics videos mm. and, um, you know, listening to the commentary and stuff. Sometimes I watch them because I'm really interested in the armies that they've picked. Sometimes I put them on so I can listen to them while I do my own hobby. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm fortunate that I've gotten to meet the boys and I have a, uh, you know, a personal connection to them at the moment as well. So when I do have questions, I can go and ask. But when you actually look at the way they behave in regards to all their followers, they're quite happy to chat to yeah. anyone. Um, so if you have a question about something with them, you can go and say, hey, guys, how did you do that? What did you do that with? And you do get answers. Hmm. So if you find a YouTube channel or some sort of giant social media construct that you really, you, you know, you go, wow, I want to, I want to know more... Hmm. Go to them and ask. Yeah, definitely. Most of these hobbyists are just like you and are completely approachable and are more than happy to share their passion with you. And if you find one that isn't, ignore them as the outlier and find somebody else. Look, in all the ones I've ever reached out to, not one of them's ever turned me down in terms of me asking for advice or me seeking information or anything no. like that. They've always been helpful. And that's why I'm saying that if you do find one, then... That's the, it It, is the outlier rather than the norm. Yeah. Um, So don't be put off and try again, basically. No, I mean, all of the the major ones are are generally very open and forthcoming. And um, we've got some interviews with a few of them coming up for this podcast. Yeah. And I think with what you were saying before, um, one of the things that you can do is actually to create, uh, I want to use the term mastermind group, um, but really just a 
Now, it can be as simple as creating a Facebook chat little group that where you're all trying to achieve similar goals to all motivate each other. Yeah. Or where you can bounce ideas backwards and forwards or... Or trash talk for the next game or... <laughs> yeah, whatever whatever is going to work for you based on what you want, are hoping to achieve with your hobby. Yeah, absolutely. So, which brings me back to my favourite thing, which we will cover in more um, detail next episode, but about setting goals. So, one of the things that you can do to really pull yourself out of a slump is to work out... What do I want to achieve? How am I going to do that? Because once you know that, it then makes it much easier to build that motivation and that excitement as opposed to, you know, some kind of vague overarching statement that becomes really difficult to measure. When you've got something, I want my Warlord Titan tabletop ready by the apocalypse game that's happening mid-January, it becomes much more real. Yeah, that's true. But I also think um, there's ways without turning it into a formal goal. Like, I'm not viewing it that way. I'm viewing it as no, a but, passion but project. But that's exactly what it is, though. Yeah, but for me, that that then turns it into a chore. Uh, see, I find there's... I understand what you're saying. But for me, it doesn't necessarily have to be formalised as in, you know, written down that by such and such a date, this will happen. But it does need to be really um, – you need to have a concrete idea about what it is. You need to have sat down and fleshed out what it is that you – where do you want to go? What are you hoping to do? What is it that you love about this? What do you want to do? Where do you see yourself going? Because without having that kind of direction, you're going to flounder. Yeah, but like one of the things I always try and do – when I hit these weird moments of hobby boredom, and I suppose that's the best way I can describe it, where I don't feel like doing anything whatsoever, it's always a passion project that gives me a shove in the right direction. Mm. It's painting something that I actually am inspired to do. And the the goal is never about the date. The goal is I really want to do this. I want to see it finished. Having said that, if you don't have that date, you don't get it done. Not always. Really? How's the um, new table that we've got for the last show slash Masters <laughs> event going? Did you get that it's washed? Terrain. Yes, I did. Did you? You had all these great ideas and you were inspired and you wanted to run wires and lighting and cameras and, you know, it was so exciting. How far did you get with it? I understand where the the hurdle that I couldn't cross for that project was. Yeah, you couldn't be no. bothered. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's a gap in my skill set that I don't know how to resolve at the moment. So why don't you do anything about it? Because I don't know who to talk, talk to about it. You, you do? No, I don't. Anyway. Anyway, I'm telling you I don't. <laughs> like, um, and with When the... we get off air, I'll tell you who you can go <laughs> okay. to and talk to. Fair enough. Would have been useful nine months ago. Should have told me that that was what the issue was, shouldn't you? Anyway, you could have painted it. Yeah, I didn't want to. <laughs> it wasn't my table. I didn't want to do it. <laughs> Fair enough. No, the um, for me, I try and find something I want to paint and I want to be engaged with. Mm. And that's what I use to change what's going on for me. Mm. It doesn't have to have a date set to it, but I find something I want to do because it's a cool model. It doesn't even have to be the game I'm playing. I've picked random models over the years and just painted them because I wanted to paint them, not because I had to paint them or they were part of an army or a project. They were just cool to do. Um, you know, go on to, I don't know, Forge World or Weird or any of the... And just find a cool model. Order it. Paint it. And that can be enough to make you go, oh, I remember why I enjoy painting, or that was a really cool model. That might lead you down the garden path of a new game or a new faction within the game you play. Um, but I think that that's also times where that mastermind group can really come in handy but so that you're not, um, you know, shouting into an open room, basically. You've got somebody, other people there to go, hey, what do you think about this? Or I was thinking about doing this conversion to it. Or, you know... 
what colour schemes do you reckon is going to work best? Or I was going to use this for X army. What do you think I can do? You know, like having people to bounce that idea up, those ideas off in the same way that you're doing at the moment with the Titan, with the other gamer who he's building his and, you know, you're having these And our patrons. The patrons are getting their two cents as well for us at the moment. Yep. And you're also sharing ideas with different gamers around different things that you can do with the Titan once it's finished. Those are all ways that you're interacting with other people in order to build that motivation. Yeah, okay. I can see that. Good. I'm glad. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I think accountability buddies work really well as well. And that's similar to what you've got going on with the other gamer who's building the Titan at the moment. Yeah. Well, him sending me the photos of it. He's not pinned at all. He's at least letting all the glue dry at the moment yeah. before he starts drilling all the pins and things into it. But seeing it built to the waist has made me go, oh, crap. I just need to start getting on this. Mm. So, But finding someone who's going to call you out as well. Mm. Yeah. Well, he he's already said he wants the two of us to take them down to a Games Workshop store for a night and, um, and do like a 12,000 point everyone else versus the two warlords. And he's fly in, fly out, so he's even got less time than I do, in theory. Um, although I know he's here um, at least for the next couple of weeks because he's offered to come around and um, bring all the paraphernalia he's used to get his to that point to help me get mine to that point. Um, Which is good because he's not letting you use the excuse of, oh, I'm afraid or I don't know how to do it or, you know, yeah. it's actually going, well, no, seriously, get a bill. Yeah. And I think we all... We all need that at times. And often what can happen is that we have really kind, caring, compassionate friends who allow us, who indulge that sense of, uh, no, you need someone to go, you know what, get off your butt and get it done. Because when you're doing is when your motivation picks up again. Yeah, absolutely. Which brings me to my last point, doing. So, oh, actually, no, I've got two points. Um, But when you are going to do something... When you're feeling low, pick the low-hanging fruit. Yeah. You know? Don't pick the. <laughs> don't pick your overall goal when you've done no hobby for nine months, of painting the thousand-pound warlord titan. Unless that's really going to work for you, which clearly it is. But you know, pick something that's going to be easy, and you're going to get a big win from it. Celebrate your wins, all of your wins. And pick something where you're going to be able to do something really easy and see a big result from it. You know what? I reckon if you hit up um, OTP Terrain and get one of their terrain, the 3D printed terrain kits, there's some beautiful terrain there. Terrain can be easy to paint. Can it? Well, it can. It can. It's just never easy well, for you. Uh, that's, Actually, no, but it's that's, really easy for you to yeah. paint because you don't do it. Richard and but, I do it all. But that's. <laughs> I know that a terrain doesn't excite me, but I know plenty of people who... When you can get a kit like that, like they've got their big bridges and um, yeah. the cathedral and those sorts of kits, they're affordable, they look great, they're not tied to any one army, it's an accessory to the game that you're already playing to make the game more engaging. I could easily see one of those sort of generic kits where you get to build a big cathedral or a, a bridge overpass or a big shipping, they do, they do this awesome shipping crane, really easy to build, really easy to paint. But it's a big wow factor as well. Mm. I think those sorts of kits, like you say, something that's relatively easy. It's um, going to have a big impact. Yeah. I yeah. think that would be a great way of doing it. Yeah. It helps that I'm looking at a big pile of the painted OTP terrain right now. <laughs> and this one really is my last, um, my last piece of advice that I had written down. And it comes back to that decision fatigue thing that I talked about earlier because I've just realised that I raised the point and then didn't talk about things that you can do to try and reduce that as an issue but you know that I'm a big to-do list person yep right and given that I'm sat here with four pages of notes for today with my to-do list of things to talk about um, but I think that rather than having a to-do list it's having a decision list so and actually going through for making an army what decisions need to be made and when do they need to be made so rather than getting overwhelmed with so many decisions, actually breaking that down. And, you know, before you buy your fo- your first model in your army, 
you don't need to have decided what color scheme you're going to be using and what decals you'll be putting on or whether or not you're going to hand paint the shoulder pads. Those decisions don't need to be made before you've walked into a store. Mm, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> but you can work out what decisions do yeah, need you to can. be made. You can. And you can break it down and you can make it easier. And by doing that, it's less likely to be overwhelming. Well, I've got a tournament in 11 days and the army lists are due in four days. Mm-hmm. I'm guessing your witches aren't going. No, they're not. <laughs> <laughs> and they won't let me take my warlord. Um, in the box, in pieces. <laughs> yeah, I wonder why. <laughs> it's more than 6,000 points. Um, For a 2,000 point game. 18, yeah, 1850, yeah. yeah. Um, oh, that's just mean. What about if you just play one game? Instead of the three. Uh, <laughs> I'll just play with <laughs> one arm. All of your <laughs> just put one arm on the table. One game. Um, no, they... So, I got the players pack yesterday. And I've got to paint one model for it for my idea at the moment. Mm-hmm. So, I've got... Uh, well, by the time this goes out, it'll be 10 days to paint that model. The model is already assembled, well, so undercoated. Like we've got Christmas in there. I know. Yeah. That's a factor. Which, by the way, you've got a whole heap of Christmas presents that need wrapping. <laughs> I bought them. I think the least you can do is wrap them. <laughs> anyway, um, I've got to decide whether I've got enough motivation to take my hands off the project in front of me to paint one model. Technically, it's two models because it's on one base. Um, you don't. Or whether or not I just go, you know what? That's not going to happen. It's not. It's probably not. I'm, it's not. Um, and then focus on what I'm doing and just take something that I've already got painted. Do that one. <laughs> But part of me goes, it's another single model that I can just cross off the list as done. It is. But at the moment, and this is another thing as well that so many gamers do, and I am writing a course about this for the patrons group. But, oh my God, learn to focus. (laughs) One project at a time. (laughs) There are so many in gamers that I've spoken to. I decided to limit myself to just three projects this year. Here's the 10 that I've got. (laughs) Okay, so we need to learn how to count. Look, my projects for this year, actually, no, let's talk 2019. Mm. Uh, The Warlord Mm -hmm. is the first one. I've got my Witches, which are ready for paint. Mm -hmm. I've got the Chaos Reaver and the Warhound I'd like to both knock off in 2019 as well. Mm -hmm. And then I've got the Space Marine Collectibles Heroes from Japan, Series 1 and Series 2. Plus, I've got the the beginnings of a space marine army that go with them from the starter box, the Dark Imperium starter box. So I've kind of got a marine army forming on the side. See, this is the thing. I've got this happening on the side. Well, I haven't Does spent that, any money on it. It's not about the money. It's about the time and it's about the focus. You know, So at the moment you're focusing on the Titan. Yeah. Do you think that the kind of the best thing that you should be doing now is not thinking about the other projects and getting the Titan done. Well, that's I'm doing really well. They're sat no, here no, bes- you're not doing really well I because am. you've just told me that you're thinking about taking time away from this project to paint another no, model no, no. in uh, order to go to this event. Oh, but that's one model. It's one model. But how much time have you got? I really and I can tell you, not a lot. No. Because we've got three kids at school holidays. Christmas is coming up. We've got, we haven't got our event schedule sorted out for 2019 yet. Show's got all sorts of things happening. Do you have time to be taking time away from that? Probably not. No, you don't. So, so this focus. Is, this is called a reality check. Yeah. In have, term- have an accountability buddy who's prepared to go. What are you doing here, buddy? I'm not sure buddy is the right word because you're scaring me a little bit. Well, you need someone <laughs> who's prepared to stand up to you and go. That is true. You know what? This isn't going to work. Oh, well, I guess if rain doesn't get painted then. She's going to stay there for another little while. Oh, look, don't let me be the one to stop you doing it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, like all the Space Marine stuff I've got sat here, it's in boxes. It's cool. I've it's opened them and had a look. It's in boxes as well. Yeah, because I want to do what I want to do at the moment. Yeah. But after that's done... It's We've an- also got <sighs> a table that's brand new that we needed to buy. It was a good deal. That has so far had a shower. <laughs> <laughs> and probably needs another one now. No, it's fine. For those of you who are listening, um, what she's referring to is uh, the resin. No, no, don't tell anyone. 
the, <laughs> the resin Forge World tiles that you need to clean off before you can um, apply paint to them. Um, and we don't know. Well, actually, to be fair, I don't think they'd fit in any standard bathtub. You'd have to put them in a spa or something quite large because they're two foot square. Um, so I took them all into the shower and washed them in the shower. He was closed at the yes. time, just in case anyone has a bad mental picture. No, exactly. Hot water running with a, a dish, like dishwashing liquid and, and whatnot, but fully clothed. So, because they didn't actually get in the shower. Just as a side note, because it's quite unlike me to go off on a tangent, but he went and did the shopping and came back with a, so it's like one of those um, dishwashing wands. So it's got the foam sponge on the end and then you fill the wand with dishwashing liquid. And I was like, oh, it's unusual for him to buy cleaning products. And then, no, no. It was to clean the Forge World tiles. Yes, it was. I should have known. <laughs> great, by the way, for those tiles because you, you can't, like I say, you can't immerse them. This is a great way of dealing with it. Hmm. Hobby tip for the night. It'd be great uh, if you used it for the saucepans as well, but you know. Yeah, I'm not going to talk to you about dishwashing, <laughs> given how many I do. Anyway, we're going to wrap up this um, rut of a topic and we're going to... Uh... So very quickly, just to um, go over some of those things that we I did. I thought we were done. Yeah, no, I know. I'm just... I'm. Rounding up. <laughs> Take a step back. Work out what the actual issue is. Find out where where that loss of motivation is coming from. Find three people, podcasts, blogs that are going to motivate you or going to inspire you and spend time with them. And then actually implement something that you found motivated from them. Celebrate the wins. Pick the low-hanging fruit. Create a decision-making list. Get back to basics. What's your why? Surround yourself with passionate people. Set goals. Find your accountability buddy. And create your own mastermind. Or spend a thousand pounds on a Titan and feel really bad if you don't get it painted. Or that. (laughs) There will inevitably be pictures and photos of my Titan. But having wrapped that up, why don't we take a quick break and we will wrap up the episode for today. Well, there's enough anecdotes there that um, you'll be hearing a lot about my Titan in future episodes, I'm sure, as it gets painted and yeah. produced. And there'll be I'm photos sure on the website well. and there'll be all sorts of stuff happening with it. Um, it's a cool kit. And I think that's part of the reason I'm so keen to do it, is apart from the price tag. Um, I also think that one of the reasons that you are um, still motivated, which for you being a couple of days in, that can be enough where you go, meh is that it's a relatively easy kit to build as well from what you've looked at and what you've seen apart from the fact that you're petrified of putting the legs together. Yeah, the legs really do worry me. Um, And I understand why they worry me and I'm reasonably confident that it's all just in my head but they still concern me at the moment because you're putting... What's the worst that can happen with that thousand pound model? It breaks at the ankles and falls face first. Yeah, that's what I thought too. Yeah. Um, (laughs) No, the, um, the kit itself is having flicked through the instructions and laid all the pieces out, it's a box on legs, Mm -hmm. basically. And unlike, I've seen a lot of horror stories about this particular kit with people going, all these warped panels and there's all this, you know, problems with heating it up and, you know, getting it to fit right. I'm not seeing any of that in the kit. There's there's a little bit of like warpage, but nothing remotely resembling what I've seen online. And nothing remotely resembling what you've had in previous kits either. No, but I wonder whether that's because this one came back in our suitcase as opposed to being posted. Mm. Um, but then again, it still goes on a plane in a in yeah, cargo. It never got chucked around by posties though. Yeah, and it, oh, it also was surrounded in like a suitcase with clothes and stuff and. Mm. Um, so maybe the pressure and temperature changes weren't as severe or... I don't know. I don't know either. But, um, yeah, the the kit itself... Like, I'd rather build one of these than a Warhound. The Warhound's appalling for the legs. Anyone who's built one will agree with me there. Um, but, yeah, I really want to build this. I've um, finished dry-fitting the head tonight and green-stuffing all the um, the little pock marks that come with resin casting. Mm. There's only half a dozen on the head, which was great. It all dry fits and goes together, so I'll um I'll probably try and get that glued tomorrow, and then um 
I, sh- I want to do the guns, I want to do the arms, but I should do the legs. So... <laughs> what did I say? Low-hanging fruit. Pick the easy bits. Well, in that case, it'll be the guns. Um, <laughs> you do what you need to do in order to get to the point where you feel most comfortable and you can move forward and get it done. Mm. Or maybe it'll be the guns tomorrow then. I don't know. I'm a big believer that you eat dessert first. <laughs> Look, it'll it'll also help me once I get the last couple of replacement bits that are missing from the kit. Yeah. Um, because sadly there were two miss one two missing parts. Mm. So um, as soon as we get those, that'll help as well because then it'll they're not necessary for the build at the moment, but they're a good excuse in my head. Mm. So. <laughs> the other thing, and it comes back to what I was saying before about um talking to the people who are going to motivate you, but you're concerned about putting the legs together which is whether that's a valid concern or not, it's still a concern that you have. There are how many people in WA who have built this model? My guess, eight to ten. But you know... Half a dozen of them. You know, yeah, so you've got the opportunity to be able to reach out and to ask them. Hmm. So there are people there who are generally within the community that we have here in WA. People are supportive and kind and happily give their time in order to support other gamers yeah so you've got that kind of network there that you can draw upon to help you build the legs yeah that's true um the the weird part for it i suppose is um i just keep seeing all the weak points and trying to figure out how to reinforce them easily and maybe you should have him sitting down <laughs> uh, no you can't build him sitting down darn crouching um, no, the knees kind of force you into a either a standing or a striding pose. Mm, striding. Triangles are the strongest shape. Mm, I don't know. I don't know. It's still a concern for me because if I don't get the legs level and the waist level, then the whole thing doesn't stand up. And you can't put it on a base. If you put it on a base, you might as well just put it on a two foot, three foot square. <laughs> um... <laughs> That's my concern, is trying to get it to stand up. So, um, but I've got, I've, got the, I've got the theory, and um, hopefully it'll work. It'll be fine. I have faith in you. Well, using Araldite, there is no return, so <laughs> it'll either stand or it won't at that point. I've seen people do it, um, so it's stood on, essentially on one leg, like it's lifting its back foot, yeah. so it's on a toe, and I've seen it stood on... Um, uh, destroyed vehicles before as well, yeah. and I keep looking at those ones that with like the wrecked vehicle under its foot, thinking you didn't make the feet level, did you? <laughs> that feels like a uh, a good Quick, way of getting around that. Quick, something underneath this. <laughs> it could make be it wrong. Look like it was supposed to be like that. But um, yeah, it's even though though I have these hesitations, I still want to build the kit. Mm. So it's been good for me because it lets me do a bunch of cool hobby without um, doing an army. Anyway. Awesome. Um, we I think the next podcast is due just after Christmas. It'll be New Year's Eve, Eve? New Year's Eve? I'm not sure if it's New Year's Eve, Eve or New Year's Eve. <laughs> um, oh, the next one's actually just after New Year's. Oh. So um, we'll be live on Boxing Day, mm. um, which will be interesting. I wonder how much I've assembled by then. Show it off live, hopefully. I actually thought, sorry, I thought that we were next live on Christmas Eve. That's why I thought we were. No, it's Boxing Day. Yeah, fair enough. And then um, the next podcast will come out on the 2nd of January 2019. Mm -hmm. So um, we might as well take this opportunity now since this is the last podcast for 2018. Merry Christmas. Um, Yeah, to say Merry Christmas to all our followers and our listeners Mm -hmm. and um, especially to our patrons who've started supporting us for 2018 and we look forward to giving you guys more content in 2019. We have to say thank you to all our tournament attendees across 2018. Um, we had 300-odd unique players over 2018, which was... Not including show, obviously. No, that was just what went through Down Under Pairings. It doesn't even include WATC, mm. um, which is pretty amazing. Mm-hmm. We have to thank everyone who supported us with show, all the Games Workshop Warhammer staff, um, Aiden, a big thank you to Micah in particular for the RPG stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, all the TOs and volunteers, all the people who helped us set up and pack up. Um, there's too many names there to list off. There are indeed. And I'll forget someone important, which yep. Don't is do it. never a good thing. Um, we have to say thank you to Emma's dad, 
for the bar service at the events. We have to say thank you to Emma's mum for the looking parents. after the kids, <laughs> for letting us run these events. Yeah. Um, they have names as well. So they do answer to Emma's mum or Emma's dad, but they are also Catherine and Mark. So if you if see them at an event, yeah, you can call them Catherine or Mark. You don't have to call them mum and dad, but they do answer to it. So <laughs> it's completely fine. Um, I just thought I'd add that in since I noticed at Masters there were a lot of people calling my dad, dad. <laughs> That's pretty cool. <laughs> Standing at the um, window going, dad. <laughs> <laughs> Which was great, except one of the guys who was doing that was 70. So oh he's gosh. a bit older than my dad. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, we have to wish everyone a safe and Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Mm-hmm. And we look forward to seeing you all again in 2019. And, and if you don't celebrate Christmas, then happy whatever it is holiday that you break. do celebrate. Yep. Yep. Um, you will continue to hear us in 2019, um, where we hopefully have some more content for you to see us as well as hear us. That's right. Our dulcet tones will continue. I know plenty of people are listening now. It's quite interesting seeing some of the numbers come through. It's um, really exciting for us, or at least for me, because I get to see all the analytics. Um I just feel like I'm shouting into an empty room, so it's still good. Do me a favour and actually tell her in the comments, whether you see this on our website or on Facebook or wherever you see this, tell her she's not shouting into an empty room for me. Yeah, it's all good. I like listening to the sound of my own voice. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So hopefully we will see you all again for 2019. We hope you've enjoyed spending your time with us as much as we've enjoyed spending our time with you, even if it is virtually and unknown when we record it or publish it no in all seriousness um we did start objective secured as you know this is my why Uh, this started as a way to try and um, build and create community and to try and bring people together and it really is incredibly exciting to see so many people supporting that vision of um, a bigger gaming community and a stronger gaming community and we literally couldn't do it without all of the amazing people that chip in to create everything that we do so yeah you know there's two of us that i guess stand as figureheads for a lot of the events and a lot of the things that we do but so many people that make it actually happen yeah there is there is certainly a significant amount of work that goes on behind the scenes that most players will never see um, and potentially never even think of or consider Mm. Um, but uh, we have to say thank you to all the volunteers past and present and And hopefully hopefully future future. (laughs) Um, So until we see you in 2019 or until you hear from us in 2019, stay safe, enjoy your break and uh, get as much hobby in as you can before you have to go back to work. So uh, yeah, enjoy your break. Santa's very kind with some new toy soldiers for you for Christmas. Um, Santa made me carry mine back from the UK, but that's fine. Yeah, Santa gave you the vat back as well. There you go. So, no, um, in all seriousness, yeah, we hope you have a safe and merry Christmas holiday season and happy gaming, everyone. You've been listening to the Objective Secured podcast. If you'd like to get in touch, you can visit our website, objectivesecured.com.au. You can find us on Facebook, Facebook forward slash Objective Secured, or you can email us, obsec at optusnet.com.au. Thanks for listening. <laughs>